All right, ladies and gentlemen, good evening, or good afternoon. Uh, Mr. Pfeiffer, who is typically chairing this group, is out of town on uh, directed travel by his employer. So he will not be here. I don't know, he's on boondoggle somewhere. Those government employees are. So anyway, uh, at this point, I'll ask Mr. Garcia to please take the roll. Eva Henry, Steve Odoricio, Jeff Baker, Lisa Jones, Bob Gardner, David Beacom, Eddie Wheelock, Sean Wood, Nicholas Williams, Anthony, Kevin Flynn, Roger Partridge. Here. Laura Thomas. On the phone. Yep, I hear you. Ron Angles, Libby Zabo, Tina Francone, Bob Pfeiffer, John Marriott, Bob Roth, Allison Hiltz, Larry Vidham, David Spellman, Aaron Brockett, Here. Margo Ramsden, Baca, Matt Johnston, Roger Hudson, Ben Price, George Teal, Jason Bauer, Tammy Mauer, Here. Catherine Hyder, Laura Christman, Earl Holland, Richard Champion, Dale Christie, Rick Teeter, Benjamin Hughes, Debbie Nasta, Catherine Whitman, Steve Conklin, Here. Linda Olson, Cheryl Wink, Bill Gipp, Daniel Dick, Drew Peterson, Lisa Jones, Laura Brown, Lynette Kelsey. Here. Scott Norquist, Storm Glore, Jim Dale, Paul Hazeman, Ron Rakowski. Present. Mike Hillman, Stephanie Walton, Christine Berg, Dana Goodwine, Jacob LeBure, Jerry Bean, Isaac Levy, Karina Elrod, Kyle Here. Schachter. Karina, are you on the phone? I am on the phone. Jacob Lofgren, Larry Strzok, Wynn Shaw, Here. John Peck, Marsha Martin, Ashley Stolzman, Tony Sullivan, Barney Drystadt, Joyce Palazuski, Paul Sutton, Sean Forey, Chris Larson, Jordan Sowers, Julie Mullica, John Dyack, Kelly Daigle, Roberta Mooney, Mark Lasis, Jessica Sandgren, Becky Phillips, Herb Atchison, Here. Bud Starker, Adam Zarin, Deborah Perkins Smith, Elvin Meter. All right, ladies and gentlemen, before you also have the summary of the September 5th board work session, is any comments or corrections that we need to make on that? Okay. At this point, the chair uh, requests that there be no public comment on issues for which a prior public meeting has been held before the board of directors. If there is one from the public who has a comment, your time is up to three minutes, but you're more than welcome to please come up. Right, seeing none, we'll move on to Miss Lindsay. <laughs> it's further than you thought, huh? Beyond. Beautiful. Can everybody hear me? Wonderful. So I am Emily Lindsay. I'm a transportation planner here at Dr. Cog, and I am excited to share with you today an update on our draft active transportation plan. So I came to the full board meeting, I believe in July, to give you guys a brief update, kind of near the end of the meeting, so there wasn't a lot of robust discussion, so I'm excited to hear what you all think today. Just as a quick reminder, we kicked off this project at the end of the calendar year um, 2017. And we've been working with local governments, local government stakeholders throughout the year um, to develop this active transportation plan. We did local government outreach meetings in June. We also did some public outreach on Bike to Work Day. 
um, and we've been working with stakeholders to develop a draft network over the summer and into the early fall. So we're here. We finally have a draft plan to present um, to you all and to our stakeholders before we release anything for public comment. So we're excited to hear your thoughts. Some outreach highlights to date, we've engaged 55 participants from 31 different agencies at five meetings across the region in June. Um, those were those workshops that I referred to earlier. Uh, we also conducted an online survey and solicited over 400 comments um, from members of the public. We were also at 10 stations on Bike to Work Day and received over 200 responses to an engagement activity and talked to hundreds of others. So this is no surprise to anybody, but there's a lot of potential for active transportation for bicycling and walking across the region. A lot of Coloradans are known for getting out there on the weekends for fun, for exercise, um, whether biking, walking, running, jogging, hiking, the like. There's a lot of potential. Um, over half of folks report during a typical month that they get out on their bicycle um, for fun or for exercise. But we know that a lot of folks don't translate that into utility trips, to trips to work or to trips other than places other than work. We also conducted a resident survey to learn a little bit more about barriers and opportunities um, when we're thinking about active transportation and the infrastructure that we build. We, this is just a snapshot. There's a whole lot more statistics um, in the plan and appendix. But I just wanted to give you a quick overview of some of our findings. So we asked folks how comfortable or somewhat comfortable, um, and on the other side, somewhat uncomfortable and very uncomfortable, um, how they would feel on some of these facilities. So it was no surprise if there's no bicycle facility on a four-lane roadway, most people don't feel very confident. When you add a bicycle lane, a lot more people report feeling very or somewhat comfortable, but really it's a much slower number. 20% would feel very comfortable. So there's a big chunk of folks that maybe they'll use it to connect from a trail to their house, but they don't really want to. Um, then when you add a buffer in there, a lot more folks report being comfortable. Um, the separation from traffic translates to roughly 40% of folks that would feel very comfortable and over 80% of people that would feel very comfortable or somewhat comfortable. And then when you add kind of complete separation from traffic, a side path, a shared use path, a separated bike lane or a cycle track, we're seeing numbers over 90%, nine out of 10 people would feel very or somewhat comfortable biking in these scenarios. So this just re reinforces the concept of a high comfort network and the importance of separation of bicycle, bicycles from um, vehicular traffic. Let me just mention one more thing. So how many of you guys have heard of the four types of cyclist surveys? This is, yeah, a, pretty, a couple of you. So we, we use these results from this survey to develop our own kind of ranking. And we found 60% of folks are interested but concerned when it comes to biking, which is about the same as the national, national average. We did have a somewhat higher percentage of people that were in that very confident bracket, which again, being Colorado, is not too surprising. Um, but there's a still big chunk of the population that is a little uncomfortable. And on that same vein, we found out that folks would bike or walk more if there were more shared use paths, this more separated from traffic approach, around 70% of folks. And then just to give you the full breakdown, so 4% highly confident cyclists, those are those enthused, confident, I'm sure you know one or two of the, these folks. Then we have the 12% of people that are somewhat confident. Um, and those are like the typical commuting cyclists. Um, I'm sure you know some of those as well. And then the 60% of people that are interested but concerned when it comes to bicycling. Um, we did have around 25% of folks that are just not interested, no way, no how, are they interested in bicycling. And that is lower than the national average. So. You all had a link to the draft active transportation plan, um, but I just wanted to give you some, a quick overview of some of the major themes. Safety, crashes, this is something that comes up time and time again with our stakeholders, which is another reason we really focused on high comfort facilities, because they really do improve safety and perceived safety. This kind of translates into comfort and usability. Again, based on our survey data, we really wanted to focus on comfortable facilities, people that 
facilities that were usable um, by people that were traditionally not comfortable on like those facilities that have a bike lane or no bike lane. Connectivity of local and regional networks, of course, another big topic, um, along with access to and from transit and equity across active transportation options is something we considered, especially with low no vehicle households, um, an aging population. We really need to make sure that folks that need access to the active transportation network have that. And so this just follows along kind of with your table of contents if anybody has the draft plan pulled up. And we'll go through each one of these in a little more detail. So the introduction, chapter one, outlines some of the planning framework um, and kind of gives you a preview of what's to come and highlights that we'll show, showcase local examples, um, of course, describe the relationship to MetroVision and the MetroVision RTP, um, and we'll introduce kind of the, the order of the concepts. So chapter two, I, no, chapter, let's look. Yes, chapter two introduces the Regional Active Transportation Network. And these are a bunch of different components that are described in detail, starting on page 19. Um, but just to give you a preview, we identified pedestrian focus areas. These are areas that have a high concentration of existing or potential pedestrian activity, and we identified using um, data from throughout the region, along with some stakeholder input. We also identified short trip opportunity zones, and this is something that's not traditionally completed in a bicycle pedestrian master plan, and this is kind of something of our own creation here. We wanted to make sure that since the region is so large and trips historically in the active transportation sector are so short, that we were taking account um, for these opportunity areas for short trips. So to do that, we used our travel model data um, to look at areas that have a concentration of short trips, which we classified as two miles or less because the average bicycle trip in our region is 1.8 miles. So we thought that would be a good proxy. And then the active transportation corridors, which we'll get into a little bit later, these are kind of the big picture. The, sorry, I keep moving my hand away. Um, <laughs> the big picture vision for high comfort routes that connect destinations throughout the region. Um, they might serve longer trips. They might also serve as connectors. Uh, between important destinations. So they might just be a couple short short miles uh, that connect a longer trip. These are all critical to connect with local networks. Um, so we really look to local communities and to their planning processes, whether existing or kind of proposed. We considered different facility types that connect these different geographic areas. So here is an example, and this is highlighted in the plan on page 22. This, sorry, okay. It's highlighted in the plan on page 22. It shows kind of how these different network components all connect. There's the blue line, which is the active transportation corridor. We have the, the purple areas that are pedestrian focus areas, and then we have short trip opportunity zones, which are those areas in orange. And so they're not necessarily exclusive, some of them overlap, but it's just to illustrate the importance of developing connected, safe and comfortable active transportation components. All right. And then the next chapter um, is the tools for local implementation chapter. And this is really the toolkit of the plan where we look at new and emerging topics um, and some different planning level implications for the, from the topic some key resources and some areas that our local communities are excelling in. To give you guys an example, um, if you're curious what your neighbor is up to. And I'm happy to dig into this if anyone is interested. And then also we outlined the planning framework, local and regional strategic initiatives. These are in line with MetroVision um, and the planning framework presented there for consistency. Um, we also highlight relevant case studies there as well. This is kind of the taking action side in that next chapter. And then county profiles are something I would like to walk through um, with you guys, if you could all pull up the draft plan. Let's see. So this is Appendix 1. 
And even though it's an appendix, it was a really important part of the development of the plan. Maybe I too can pull it up. And basically, this, this was part of our existing conditions assessment that, oh. Sorry, everyone. The packet's not loaded, right? You can pull it up. So basically, this, these county profiles allowed us to take a look at, oh, of course, I'm clicking on my meeting. That's what happens. Um, take a look at existing conditions for active transportation across the region, especially because it's such a big region, it's a 10 county planning area. There's a lot of kind of intricacies and local things happening in jurisdictions that might not affect the region, but we certainly want to highlight and went into the overall network building process. So, here we go. Hopefully. Okay. All right, well, we had a faster internet connection. <laughs> Here we go. So do we have folks from Adams County here today? All right. We got someone. So I'm going to walk us through the Adams County um, County profile just to give you an idea of what is included in these profiles. So we covered the planning context just to give folks that aren't familiar with the region an idea of, of what's happening in, in local Adams County. We look at some socio-demographic factors. Um, Adams County is welcoming, you know, six, 60,000 new residents from 2010 to 2017. So we're looking at a pretty fast growth rate. Um, and what are potential reasons for that? Also, some socio-demographic factors that might implement or impact the implementation of some of these ideas. Uh, it has a very low median age, 33, a high percent of Hispanic and Latino residents and the second highest family poverty rate in of the regional counties. So to do that, planning and engagement of citizens, there are some ideas on how to customize this for Adams County, and each county is a little bit different on how um, this is set up. But we all cover the basic planning context, and we highlight plans and policies that are really important that we took a look at in Table 10. We provided a sample. There are many, many more, um, highlighted in another appendix, a uh, local plan inventory. But we wanted to highlight some of the great work that's happening in Adams County. Um, for example, the Walk Bike Fit Plan in Commerce City, Connect North Glen, Westminster's Mobility Action Plan, and provide people what the, the big idea of this, these planning efforts were. And this can help cross-jurisdictional coordination um, and maybe inspire some neighboring jurisdictions to do the same. And then, like I was saying, as part of the existing conditions um, evaluations, we looked at existing facilities. Of course, Adams County has an awesome foundation for um, safe biking on their off-road network, the South Platte Trail, Sand Creek, Clear Creek, High Line. They've got them all. Um, and so this presents a great opportunity and a backbone, backbone for the regional active transportation network. We used our bicycle facility inventory to calculate some statistics about the kinds of bicycle facilities that are present in Adams County. You can see they have over 170 miles of paved trail, um, 70 miles of unpaved trail, some bike lanes, some neighborhood paths. So they have a pretty good foundation to build on. We also look at activity levels. Again, we're kind of limited with this statistic just based on data availability, but we do look at the uh, percent of folks that bike or walk to work, Adams County folks are clocking in at around 2%. Um, and where there's a, lot, a big shift in workers that live in one county or, and work in another, we made sure to note that because it's a pretty important consideration when you're thinking about active transportation um, as a commute method and whether you need to pair it with transit if people are traveling longer distances or if most people are living and working in the same county maybe active transportation for the whole trip is a little more viable. We also looked at traffic fatalities. There is a whole separate report that we put together about crashes. So this is just 
to give folks a quick update about what's happening. We looked at used crash data from 2010 to 2015. And so compared to the commute mode share, which is around 2%, um, we see that it's overrepresentative in terms of folks um, fat of fatalities. 20% of traffic fatalities in Adams County are bicycles and pedestrians. That's pretty close to the regional average. Um, but it's very interesting to look at it county by county. So you can get some more localized information than just our regional averages. OK, we'll go back. So yeah, so that's kind of the purpose of the county profiles. We're really excited to hear what people think, if there should be additions to the county profiles, if there's plans that, they, that folks would like to highlight that we missed, um, or any other planning context that they'd like to be included. We're looking forward to hearing more from our stakeholders on that. Um, but yeah, like I mentioned, we do have a dedicated report, standalone bicycle pedestrian crash report is coming soon, and we'll be um, publicizing that as soon as we have that final designed copy for you all. And this has a lot of great information that's very specific to bicycle and pedestrian crashes throughout the region. It looks at a variety of factors, um, way more than we could talk about today. This could be a presentation in its own. So we look forward to sharing with that with you all soon. So I'm happy to take questions. Any comments or questions from anybody? Mr. Chair, uh, I saw you had a, a slide in there, an image of someone on uh, a scooter on that. What type of engagement did you get from the, obviously Denver's, um, try to choose my words wisely, dealing with that right now, uh, but what kind of engagement from the other outlying areas did you get on kind of dockless mobility? Not just scooters, but kind of bikes and e-bikes and the possibility of that to start to improve uh, usage. Yeah. So in our Tools for Local Implementation, we covered e-bikes, bike share, dockless mobility, kind of the suite of those kind of new and emerging technologies. It's been really interesting. Over the course of the year, you know things have changed drastically in this space. Bike share, dockless bike share was introduced in Aurora. It's now since concluded. Dockless mobility was implemented in Denver. Um, and I think from the stakeholder perspective, they're really interested in seeing how these things can all work together because they're small vehicles. They're for short trips. They move at relatively slow speeds. I think people are, for the most part, pretty uncomfortable with the sidewalk situation in Denver, but they do see, see similarities on shared use paths or um, in bike lanes, because they're moving at relatively low speeds, kind of like bicycles. Um, so without trying to date ourselves preemptively, <laughs> knowing that this is like a really changing and emerging field, we highlighted examples where we can. We certainly noticed and have discussed the data impl implications of kind of shared use mobility, e-bikes, the like. Um, and that was a pretty big, let's get together and coordinate on this effort. Um, but from a like plan building perspective, it was taken into account, but there was no lines drawn on maps just to cater to dockless mobility options. I think people are just considering as a suite of like shared active transportation services. Brock. This is Karina Alrod from Littleton. I have a question. All right, just a second. Go ahead, Aaron. Go ahead. On, uh, when looking at Arapahoe County, Arapahoe County obviously is very different on the west as it is on the east. Can we get behind some of this data to um, zero in on a particular city? Um, so if there's a specific data set that you're interested in, we're happy to look at, into that on the back end. Um, if there's major indicators that you like pulled out for a city, what, it would be helpful if you could just shoot me an email and let me know what you're looking for and we can try to integrate that into Thank you. the profiles. Anyone else on the phone? Okay, Mr. Brockett. So I just, Emily, I just want to say thank you and congratulations on a great job. Um, I was really impressed by the draft plan. I looked through it in advance. And um, you know, a lot of th things like this are kind of fuzzy and feel good. And I really appreciated how you had, um, there's particular action items and ways to um, make things better in general and then tied to specific counties. I was impressed by that. Um, the Strava data was a nice touch. Those heat maps, that's fun. Um, so anyway, much appreciated. I think this can really help move our whole region forward on this topic. Thank you. Rex. 
thank, thank you, sir, very much. Um, I would echo that as well. I think staff did a tremendous job, as well as the stakeholders that have been involved in this. I mean, there was a big group. How, how, how many people in that stakeholder group? We've had a rotating group of over 50 people participating. That's fabulous, time. right, from around our region. I mean, trying to implement and actually aggregate all those local plans and that. Um, I thought they did a fabulous job. Um, to Nicholas's question with regards to kind of emergency modal technology and the like, um, you, you, you alluded to it, but there was a discussion at the last uh, Transportation Advisory Committee about, um, you know, kind of doing some, some kind of group, group think, data sharing. We're not quite sure what that is, but I think it's really, you know, something that's come out of this discussion that there needs to be a more collective conversation about, you know, how these new modal elements play into the, the larger picture, you know. Um, so stay tuned on that, I think, is really the answer. You might have further comments. I was, I was going to say, yeah, I, I mean, I think we're, we'd love to collaborate here. I think this is, as this, um, there's a desire for these by the company, certainly, and I think for some residents for it to become more regional. I think if we can, the better we can coordinate our efforts on that, I think the better for the region. But yeah, we're, we're more than excited to, to work with Dr. Cog and his forum on that. Sir. Other comments or questions on this item? So what I might do, Mr. Chairman, if I may, just to give you some idea of what the, what the schedule is going forth. Um, so our hope is to get this out for a public review and comment probably by the middle of this month. Um, if we can get it back to you all in November, we will. But if not, you'll, uh, you'll see it in, in, um, in December in its final form. So um, I, again, I want to thank staff and all the staff of, your, our, of our communities for working very, very dilig diligently on this over the last year and a half or so. Thanks, Emily. Sanchez Warren. She's going to talk about AAA. Out. Oh, okay. Lots of information coming up. All right. While I'm getting this up, just for those of you that are new, those of you that are new, Dr. Cog is the designated area agency on aging for uh, the metropolitan area. There are over 630 area agencies on aging. What happened? There we go. Mm, this is not what I want. OK, we'll do this. Isn't the right format? Can somebody help me? Just get it full screen. Oh, well. Yeah, I can't get it to advance. It didn't advance. Oh, there. Ah. So uh, there are 16 area agencies on aging in the state of Colorado. We are the largest. We cover Adams, Arapahoe, Denver, Douglas, Jefferson, Gilpin, and Clear Creek counties. The good news for those of you who are here from Boulder is Boulder has its own area agency on aging. They also did this survey. So you can access this survey. Thank you. Yep. Uh, yeah. Next one. Let's go to the next one. Just to be efficient. There we go. Thank you. OK. Thanks. <laughs> so what do area agencies on aging do? Well, basically, we help people age better. And how do we do that? We provide services. We fund services. We advocate. We are federally mandated to advocate on behalf of older adults and their family members. And we are the regional planning entity on aging. We are in the process of doing our area plan on aging. So every AAA in the country has to do one every four years. And part of our process for this is doing what we call the Consumer Assessment Survey for Older Adults. We've done this since 2010. So we're going to give you three sets of data so you can see how we've changed over time. The good news is Boulder County has done it uh, those, those three times as well. And every um, area, every uh, AAA in the state did a COSOA this year. So it gives us a lot of comprehensive information about older adults. Why is that so important? Colorado is the third fastest aging state in the country. Our fastest 
um, growing population, the, the fastest growing cohort groups are all 60 and over. 74 to 79 is the fastest growing, and the 90 plus is the next fastest growing. So we hear a lot about millennials, but the growth right now is in older adults. This isn't going to end when um, the boomers age out. This is the new normal. People will be living longer. This survey looks at um, six areas. As you can see, overall community quality, community and belonging, community information, productive activities, health and wellness, and community design and land use. So what does this look at? Uh, overall community, what does that mean? This is how um, residents view their community, how connected they feel to their community, and how well they can access information and services. Why is this important? In the last presidential election, 91% of the older adults in Colorado voted. They vote. You as local elected officials want to know how older adults are feeling because they vote. Um, most of the Dr. Cog uh, older residents gave high ratings to as community as a place to live, which is good. And about half of them said that the, the quality of services they get is good or excellent or good. The thing you should know in this, if you see a three-point difference, that is statistically significant. So we contracted with National Research Center to do this survey. Um, they've done it for, for these three times in 2010, in 2015, and 2018. Um, so we have a, a we, we can kind of see where we're going. Unfor unfortunately, you're going to see it's not always great news. So generally, residents will not recommend a community to a friend unless the community is seen as offering the right services with optimal effectiveness. About two-thirds of older adults said they would recommend the community to others, which is lower than the national average. You can access, so we did this, this is the, the regional report. We also did reports by county, so you can access your reports by county. We also did one for the city and county, or for City of Aurora because we're closely working with them in a number of areas as they try and adjust their older population. This is a significant statistically downward turn. Why? We don't know. But we have to figure out, and so one of the things that I do once I get this information is I go out and do community conversations and I ask people questions about what's going on in their life and what's changed. This is a concerning trend, though. Go to the next one. This is about feeling connected, about feeling safe, about um, feeling uh, respected, having a voice in your community, right? Two in five residents rated the sense of community as excellent or good. Um, I don't think there's any big changes here that I wanted to highlight. Um, feeling safe, again, is really important in your communities. And how do people feel safe? That's something that you should be asking your community. This is, again, a statistically significant decline. Fewer people feeling safe. So what does lighting look like in your community? How is crime doing in your community? Um, what, what involves um, a, lot of, a lot of people talking about traffic in our region, in our community conversations, and not wanting to go out when it's so congested? We ask people about um, crime um, and if they feel threatened. So this is a change. We're not heading in the right area in some of these, right? Being a victim of crime, 16% said they were, um, it, it's at least a minor problem. 
19%. So that's pretty good, actually, because this was our big challenge. And so we've held that steady um, in the last survey. And then being physically or emotionally abused, 8% of folks said they had a challenge with this. Community information. This is the bane of my existence, trying to help people understand the resources that are available for them, how to access information, right? So frustrating. You all in your communities provide great things, but people don't know about them. And I hear that in the community conversations. I was in Littleton at the Bemis Library, who has a, you know, a special section for seniors. And this, whole, this group of people are saying, I don't know how to access resources. And I'm like, right here, we can access resources right in this very building. 56% um, of the respondents reported being somewhat or very informed about services and activities available to them, about two in five felt that they had excellent or good information about resources for older adults. We need to do some work in this area. Information is power. The more, pow the more information they have, the better they can walk through um, the challenges of aging and the opportunities of aging, right? I was in a community and they said, we, we want more um, older adults to volunteer. And yet when I talk to the older adults in that community, they say there's no, there's no um, opportunities to volunteer. And I was like, well, okay, well, where are we missing this connection? Uh, and I think it's, it's chronic throughout our region. Community information and needs, again, a little bit more. Feeling like your voice is heard in the community. 56% said it was at least a minor problem. Finding meaningful volunteer work, 34%. Finding productive or meaningful activities, 33% said it was at least a minor problem. The next one, um, productive activities. A little bit more about this skill building and enrichment opportunities. This is a big drop in our region compared to the last two times. And then employment opportunities, we see an increase. So yay. Over one third uh, of the participants participated in some kind of volunteer work, so that's good. Uh, that's similar. So there's also another thing that you should look at is there's benchmark report that you can access, and it compares us to over four other, uh, 400 other communities. About 2 in 10 said they use senior centers, which is a little concerning. Um, but that's on par with what's happening across the country. So we're not exactly sure what's happening there. Um, uh, a lot of people have changed their name from senior center to recreation center, hoping to attract more people. Uh, still not where we would like to see it. We're seeing a decline in park use. And I can't figure out what's happening there. I don't know if it's a safety issue, if it's a transportation issue, if it's a congestion issue. Or, or if it's an accessibility issue. Are your parks accessible for older adults? This is the biggest section of the population, the, the biggest growth area. These are the people that vote for you. Can they use your parks? <coughs> Overall, 42% of the older residents in the Denver metro area said that they were providing care um, for someone else. That's a decline, which surprised me. And I asked in Jefferson County, I went out to Jefferson County, and I talked to the county councils on aging. And I said, what's going on with this? Why do you think this is happening? It's a key informant session with the county councils on aging. And one lady said, you know, I used to care for, last time you asked this question, because I go to county councils every time, I was providing care for four different people. They've passed. I don't do it as much. I'm not sure what this is. 
We know that over 265,000 um, seniors take care of grandchildren in the state of Colorado. I don't know if that's changing in the metropolitan area, so there's more research that needs to be done in this area. Did I not change? OK, good. Productive activities and needs. Half of the seniors said they were at least, a, they had at least a minor problem with having interesting or social events or activities to attend. Yeah. Thank you, Jayla. This is um, Council Member Stolzman for people on the phone. I just, I have a question. I mean, all of this is very useful and I, I appreciate the comparison year to year. It, it's sometimes hard for me to understand how these numbers compare to the general population. Yeah. You know, so it would be really interesting to know is that 42% of people having interest in cultural or recreational activities, is that the same as the rest of the population? Is that higher? Are they more yeah. interested? Are they less interested? I don't, I don't have that data, so I can't tell you that. Yeah, it, yeah. On a lot of these different ones, I've wondered that, like on the crime and safety ones and things like that, I've wondered if it is specific to this you population. You would probably see higher rates for other populations, actually. Um, yeah, I, yeah. I have no idea. So I, I've just sort of wondered that. I realize that would make the surveying much more expensive, but that would be really interesting to know if the population, if it's a, if it's a problem throughout right. the community right. generally, right. or if it's specific to the older population. Right. Good feedback. I think the reason why this is important is because isolation is a really big problem in the older adult community. And isolation leads to depression leads to higher dementia rates, leads to higher health care costs. And so we look at these kinds of things to figure out what's going on and are there opportunities in communities. As area agencies on aging, do we need to help um, create opportunities? Those types of things. How do we work with um, uh, civic groups? How do we work with um, theater groups, whatever, to engage older adults in this? We don't want older adults in our community. They use all of our resources. That's what I heard once. Yeah. <laughs> they use all of our resources, and the fire department says, my biggest call is falling. I can't get up. Look at these numbers. Older adults contributed almost $11 billion to our economy. Paid. There's a lot that are still working, and there are a lot of unpaid services. Now, this is caregiving, right? This is providing care to children and to adults and um, helping families or friends or volunteering. Who are the volunteers in your community? Who are the volunteers in your library? Who are the volunteers in your schools? Um, a lot of them are moms, but there's a lot of older adults, too. These people have value in your community. You want them in your community. They also have the highest discretionary income. Your businesses should be asking, what can I do to attract these folks to come in to my store or to use my business? Sorry? We have everything. <laughs> that's true. And that's the other thing, right? So, so the, you make a really good point because seniors don't buy goods. They buy services. My mom, she, she buys for my daughter, my 10-year-old, right? That's what she buys. But she goes to the chiropractor. She goes to the beauty shop. She goes to, um, you know, she'll buy services. She buys services a lot, physical therapy, all sorts of stuff. Yeah. Yes. One thing that uh, stands out to me on that chart, and I wonder if you can speak to that, uh, the, oh, back? the economic contribution. Uh -huh. uh, I don't know how to get. By the way, my part. wife is a, is an older adult, and she <laughs> spends all of the money on the grandkids. <laughs> yes. Not not on service. You know who the number one purchasers of toys are? Elders. My wife. Yes. <laughs> 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 and they but, buy the good stuff. They like buy the Barbie, you know, dollhouse thing yeah they buy the hundred dollar toys so on slide 17 what i notice on there is that the unpaid <laughs> the unpaid contribution is fairly steady yeah it's the paid contribution that makes me wonder if that's a, a, a sort of a negative factor that our seniors having to work more to stay in place 
or to just to support meet the basic South needs. Yeah, is more that, and more seniors are talking about they how have do you, to. How work. do you interpret that? Is that a good thing or is that a negative? Um, I think it's uh, eighteen. I think it is a. a slide it's seventeen, bold, right? Oh, 17. Yeah, there Sorry. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> um. Yeah, Brad's normally the one that helps me with this. I should have had him sitting right here. <laughs> um, it's both, right? I mean, I think there is value. What I know about healthy aging, and I've been doing this for a very long time, is people have to have a reason to get up in the morning, have to feel value, have to feel purpose. It's different when you want to work as opposed to when you have to work. And I think there's both. I think there's more people talking about have to work. We get calls probably two a week in our office um, from a 70 plus year old person who wants to try and find employment. Now part of you wants to say good for you because they don't want to be on the system. They don't want to take welfare. That's what they call Medicaid, right? And you, you want to say good for you. You know, pull yourself up by your your own bootstraps. But then on the other hand, it's sad that we have to talk about someone 70, even 80, right. who needs a job. So in, in eight years, it's more than doubled. Yep. The, the paid, yep. Uh, older adults who are paid. Yeah, you know, I haven't really looked at that. So thanks for bringing that to that my attention. Sad. And what does that mean? And I noticed that that's, that's the period that we came out of the, uh, the recession. Yep. And so it'd be, it'd be great to have some uh, drilling down on that if we could. OK. Mr. Deal, define paid. You get you get paid for the work that you do. Job. It's a not, job, not income. No, no, yep. So uh, in this, I like to go over some demographics, and if you looked at cohorts, and if you what they use for a sample size, and yeah, all of that is in the report that you have access to. I can't. I don't think I can remember it on my. But you do have. <laughs> Um, you do have access to that in the report and by your county. Um, and it is statistically significant. So we had a lower rate of people. I know. I know. But I, it, it has to be or else I have no credibility. So the National Research Center, we had a lower respondent rate than we've ever had before. I think that's partly our own fault because we tell seniors all the time, don't give any information out to anybody ever. Don't tell them your name. Don't tell them your. Don't give them your Medicare card. Don't tell them anything because there's too many frauds and scams out there. Well, I'll, two. Go ahead. A couple of things I want to look at is. Director Dale, if if you could speak into the microphone for the folks on the phone, that'd be great. Thank you. I thought I had a loud enough voice, but I'll go <laughs> on. A couple of things I want to look at is how long uh, the the sample sizes have lived in this area. Uh -huh. And then more uh, than twenty years. They've all they've yeah. lived more than twenty years. So, um, do you remember, Brad? Did you take a look at this? Yeah. And, and then each, if we got cohorts of the each three years as they age, what did they say when you when you're saying this is what they said? But as these cohorts age every three years, have their answers changed? Yeah, it's not important. the same people. Um, so, know, so what I know cool. about this population, help me. I, so it's the it's the under seventy population, and this is why we have to do community, community conversations. That answered the survey. So this was sent out to over ten thousand people. Um, the the seventy and under crowd, so sixty to seventy, answered the questions. Um, they were middle income. Uh, yeah. Do you remember? Um, yeah, they're kids. Um, and so that's why we have to do community conversations, because we've got to go talk to the older adults. We have to talk to the lower income folks. And we have to talk to minorities. They're generally Anglo, too. Go ahead. Uh, to Dr. Dale's question about um, uh, how long respondents have lived in the region. So we asked, there is a question that's, that's basically worded, how long have you lived in your community? Mm -hmm. Uh, and normally, there was, I don't remember the exact figure here, but normally it's right about 55% um, indicate that they have lived in their community for 20 years or more. The other, the thing that's important about that is community, right? That actually probably suggests that there's a fair number that would actually be within the region even longer than that. They're actually thinking about maybe their home that they're in today. Um, there's probably a fair number that have been within the Denver region even longer than that, or so that number might be larger. 
But what, we, what, we always talk about that these folks, these respondents are very uh, rooted and invested in their community, which is why it's some of these these aims are really critical because they obviously want to stay in their community um, as well. So the needs that get identified are, are really important. You know, I think one of the things too that uh, Mr. Flynn was talking about, people are living longer. And unfortunately, many of those did not plan for life this long. And we're seeing that's forcing them to go back to work in an area where normally they would not, but they don't have the support financially or physically, and a lot of them have out outlived their families. So there's there's a lot of things that go into the problem that we're seeing with the older adults going back to work, but the jailers point as well. Some of them want to, but a bigger percentage, I think, have to. Our Hour. Um, you know, you had asked earlier, Jayla, about a drop in participation in productive activities. Well, I think it's, it could be possibly a correlation to people having to go back to work. Partly. I, I think so. I think there's a, a lot of factors, right, that could contribute to that. Yeah. I think it correlates to the scooters. <laughs> well, it, I, to your point, well, Ask seniors about the scooters in Denver. Wow, they have strong opinions. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the thing we don't want, if you could just get them off the sidewalks, that'd be awesome. Because um, that's the second most common way to get from one place to another for older adults and the number one form of exercise. Uh, so that, that, that is important. So if we could like come up with some legislation to make sure they're not toys anymore. That would be cool for that. Speaking on behalf, advocating on behalf of the older adults, which remember is my job. Um, <laughs> so let's talk to, uh, about health and wellness. In this category, we look at physical health, mental health, health care, and independent living. Um, so this area is very concerning to me. We see statistically significant um, drops in the people that said it was excellent or good. Access to Quality physical health care declined between uh, 2015 and 2018 and was rated lower than the national average. Um, only 3 in 10 of Dr. Cog's older residents rated availability of long-term care options favorably. This is really concerning to me. Look at the drop in mental health services um, uh, and, and, and again, and preventative health, right? I, we've put in a lot of effort as a community, nine health fairs going everywhere. Why is this happening? These are all questions I don't know. Um, but and, and if it were just one time, I think I would question it. But we've asked these same questions for a while now. And so I think it does have more credibility that something is changing here. Most, the good news is most um, residents rated their overall physical health as excellent or good. I tend to ask this co in community conversations. I say, so how many of you feel like your health is the same as last year? And you get hands. How many worse than last year? And you get a few hands. And then how many better than last year? And more and more hands are going up. And I always say, cool, why, why is that? And they say to me, I got a new heart valve. I got a new hip. I got a new shoulder, right? Um, and so the medical advances have really improved people's lives. Um, and so and and so there's and and also I think there's something about older adults. I'm okay. Don't worry about me. But you should really help my neighbor. I hear that all the time. Yeah, I'm doing okay. It may not be our definition of okay. But especially with this senior population, it is, the, this is still the greatest generation. You know, we still have a lot of tough, tough folk. I don't know if that will always be. Yes. The, the term availability is kind of a weird one because yeah. the question is whether it is physically available to someone 
or whether it is available to someone with enough resources. Right. To, so I'm to asking those pay. questions in the community conversation. And here's what I'm hearing. Access to docs. So many docs have closed their practice to Medicare. And a lot of docs are retiring or they're going because of the, all the documentation requirements. They're quitting their practice and they're going with Kaiser. They're quitting their practice and they're going with Centura. Then that person is left without a doctor. They try and find a doctor that accepts Medicare and they, and they can't find them. Kathy Noon, one of our very own, um, it, told me this uh, a couple of months ago. She came to Aging Advisory Committee because she's on, on the Aging Advisory Committee. She said, this is crazy, Jayla. There is nobody that will accept Medicare out there. And she was having to look for, she's struggling, I think you all know, with cancer. And she's struggling to find different uh, docs to do different things and, and therapy. She said very clearly to me. The other thing is resources. So co-pays have gone up dramatically. And so people are saying, I can't afford to go have this test. I can't afford to go to the doctor because I had to put in, I had an extra expense. If I go to the doctor, I have a copay there. They're going to do a blood test, I have a copay there. They will probably send me to another test and I have a copay there. I could spend up to two to four hundred dollars in copays. I can't afford to go to the doctor. More people are exercising um, and more people are, or less people are eating more fruits and vegetables. Um, this is a problem. Access to healthy food is a problem for a lot of folks. And we see more and more people accessing food banks. Um, and food banks don't have fresh vegetables and fruit traditionally. And if they are, they're a little bit sketchy and I'm not sure you want to eat them. I've been going uh, to to more food banks to see what's on, because I keep on hearing more people talking about it. There's this little underground network. There should be an app for this. But what, what food bank has got fresh fruit? What food bank has some meat? What food bank has peanut butter? What food bank has a milk? People um, communicate that to one another. And oftentimes, in lower incomes, I'm hearing more people say that they go to food banks multiple times in a month just to supplement their food. I'm in that phase where I can't see up close, but if I have my glasses and look at you guys, you look all fuzzy. Um, <laughs> the most commonly um, cited physical problems were in physical health and staying fit and doing heavy or intense housework, right? So this is a bigger problem. Um, the most commonly cited mental health issue was feeling depressed or dealing with loss, um, and also trying to figure out how to deal with their medications. This is a big problem that we see a lot. So they go to one doc and they give them medications, and then they go to another doc and they get medications, and sometimes those medications have adverse effects, or you shouldn't take one with the other, or um, one should be discontinued, and that doesn't happen as uh, it should. Hospitalizations, 28% responded they spent some time in a hospital. Um, and 34% said they had fallen and injured, injured themselves in a 12-month in a period. Why is that significant? Because it's the uh, second leading cause of death of older adults. We don't want people to fall. Um, it leads to really high health care costs in the end of life. Um, and then oftentimes institutionalization, meaning nursing homes or assisted living. Remember that when people go into nursing homes, the average assisted living is about $4,000 in the metropolitan area, going all the way up to $12,000 a month, right? I'll, some people. A lot of people can go in and pay that privately for a couple of years, and then they go on Medicaid. Nursing homes are about $7,000 to $12,000 a month. Um, can be even more, um, depending on the care of your private pay. Moving right along, which it's not moving. 
I'm sorry. <laughs> so we want to go to slide 23. Uh -huh. Thank you. Are you just going to stay there? <laughs> Community design and land use, right? So a community that is planned well by promoting mobility and independence, meaningful engagement to its older residents, provides high quality of life for residents of all ages. This is what I want you to think of as community leaders. What are you doing um, to promote independence and mobility and engagement? In the Denver metro area, 8 in 10 residents rated overall quality of life as excellent, so that's good. Dr. Cog Elder's uh, quality of life was rated similar to other communities in the U.S. Fewer, very few older adults felt like they had good access to affordable quality housing. Well, this isn't a shock, right? This is like a huge need in the metropolitan area. But you can see that significant drop in affordable co um, from 28% saying it was excellent or good to 13%. 28% wasn't good anyway, but now we're at 13%. Um, only 27% felt positively about the cost of living. Her makes a really good point. You know, we get calls from people who said, when I retired at 65, my income was just fine. I'm 85, and it's, I, I, it's harder, a lot harder. My doctor said I'm in pretty good health. I could live maybe 10 years longer or more. I am going to run out of money. What am I going to do? We're in an interesting time because people are outliving their money at a faster rate. We looked at aspects of, of mobility, right? Ease of travel by car, 65%. I can tell you in our community conversations, I'm hearing a lot about congestion, traffic, and construction. Not wanting to go out, feeling frustrated about it, feeling nervous about it, seeing more road rage because of it. Ease of walking, this is important again, and a statistically significant decline. 62% said it was excellent or good. We don't want that to go that way. We want to go the other way. There are more in the survey, more questions about transportation. And I'm sorry, Ron, I didn't get the chance to highlight more of them, but I will in the future. About 3 in 10 um, people responded saying that they use a bus, a bus or rail or other public transportation. Again, not where we'd like it to be. So how do we change that? And there are lots of initiatives out there. And hopefully, we can be part of the solution in the future as transportation division and aging starts to work together more collaboratively. One of these things, though, is um, ridership training. It's scary for folks if they haven't been on it. Um, so we need more training for people. We need bigger font at the bus and the rail stations. Jeezo, oh, can you read that stuff? I have to like, you know, put my glasses on. And, um, and are, is it accessible? When you walk up to those ramps on the, on the um, rails, are they accessible? Let's look at all of that stuff. Here we have... 31% um, saying that safe and affordable transportation is at least a minor problem for them. 23% saying uh, that having housing that suits your needs is a problem. 16% significant um, decline in this area or, or uh, increase in the problem. 16% saying they don't have enough to eat. I'm just full of good news, aren't I? So when we look at this, the two areas that we really do need to focus on um, in the region, if we're looking at, is community information still 
It's been a problem my whole career, I think. Um, and then community design and land use are the two areas where we get the low lowest scores for community readiness. We ask some questions about, I'm going to skip a couple in the interest of time, because I know Doug's like, hurry up. Um, no. <laughs> Um, we ask questions about internet, internet use because seniors don't use internet, right? They're they're the low no they're the fastest adopters of technology. Um, they use most often technology to the email, texting, video to communicate, right? Why do you want Facebook so I can see the grandchildren? <laughs> I can see what they're doing. I want to learn how to Skype so I can talk to my grandchildren. To get news on the weather, this is my mom. She gets on the computer and checks the weather like, you know, constantly. Uh, <laughs> or news. What's happening? Research a topic, usually medical, um, where people go on to look. The least often is to uh, look at advertisements or for training in classes or to communicate with government or seek services like a license or discuss a problem. Yes. Sorry. Go ahead. I jumped in. On that research of a medical question, do they know which are credible websites? No, they, they don't. don't. I can tell you from personal experience and from community conversations, you, you always need to look at right who's sponsoring that information. Oftentimes, when you're looking up a medication or let's say you're looking up uh, a, 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 something about a disease, it's sponsored by the drug company that sells for that disease. And that's not a credible web website. Um, that's why Network of Care that we we have here is so important because it is a credible source and it's um, uh, our medical portion is done by medical professionals and doctors. If you haven't gone on it recently, take a look, drcognetworkofcare.org. Um, it's got a lot of information. So this is how they said they use the internet. Kind of good information. All right, so let's go to recommendations. These are the recommendations that Network of Care put together for us based on the information they got. Encourage um, neighborliness, promote intergenerational programs, consider community design and land use uh, policy to build community. Under community information, increase public awareness of programs and services. Take a look at your website. Are they senior friendly? Can people understand? Can they access? Is it clear? Develop a clearinghouse for all services offered to seniors and community. That's what we're trying to do hard with Network of Care. Offer information and planning activities on a large scale. Productive activities. Promote senior volunteerism. There's a lot of your communities that actually have volunteer programs. That's good. Figure out what the barriers are. Are transportation a barrier? Here's something that I've been finding out about people. I'm like, why don't you go in the community conversations? Um, well, I can't hear very good. OK, so we need to get you hearing aids or get you a hearing assessment. That's available out there. My vision's not that great. I don't have money to afford um, glasses. There are services out there, including so call the area agencies on aging. 480-6700. My staff will find services for folks. Increase um, participation of older residents in local government and community decision making. Are all your meetings at night? And if they are, OK, good. That's good. Can you have some that are in the day? Um, how is your lighting in your parking lot if they're at night? Do you, uh, when it snows or it's icy, uh, do, you, do you manage the parking lots? Because that'll keep people in, guaranteed. All right, um, pursue policies encouraging universal design and senior housing options, low maintenance. 
um, is wonderful, provide attractive fitness opportunities, support home modification repairs and services. There's some communities that waive fees um, for remodeling. That's a wonderful thing. If you can combine that with some kind of fair Home Depot says, this is how you do modifications, waive your fees for six months, have support, have vendors that you vetted, that can be a really cool thing to help people stay in their homes. Again, consider community device uh, um, design and land use policies. Oh, we already did that. So where are we? Health and wellness. So here we go. Considering zoning regulations that, it, that encourage affordable housing. I know that's hard. Can you say to your develops, developers, can you make 10% affordable housing, like they're trying to do in Denver? Um, develop programs that reduce housing costs. Develop time banks. Uh, Douglas County, excellent example of this. They have time banks in Douglas County. Um, so if I, my dad lives in Douglas County, if I volunteered, I can work, uh, I can put my time into a time bank for him and somebody else can come out and serve him. Um, senior transportation, it's a huge, huge challenge. All right, that's it. If you want more information, give me a call. Any other um, questions for Jayla? All right. Yes, please. Go ahead, Dana. We need Jayla's number. <laughs> Jayla, we really have, it would be very interesting, I think, if we could get a large part. Uh, uh, I'm not hardly qualified to get in this age qualified community. You have to be 55. And I'm struggling with that. But there are people there that would probably give you some very, very honest answers and a lot of them are the answers that we don't want to hear. They, they have spent a lifetime working, paying their bills, helping others, looking after children, all this stuff. And the cost of living suddenly skyrocketed about 2008, 2009. And then their spouse died and their income went down and then medical costs are up and they choose between pills and some of them are moving in together and that can be a problem itself uh you're welcome okay. yeah. thank you very much matthew you yes mr flynn go ahead no he's ready to next oh, thank you could you clarify what the meaning of community is was it different for I'm, my my mother-in-law passed away she was almost 101 her community her area was very limited but for somebody who's 65 or 70 it could be much broader is there a lack of consistency in the data that might explain some of the results a consistency I don't, lack of consistency in the data but in the sample I think that um I don't think there is a, a lack of consistency in the sample or in the interpretation because they keep on saying the same thing. What I realized in community conversations is that community is different for each person, right? And it's less about geographics. It's less about your county or your city or your neighborhood and more about the people around you. So people are saying to me, my community is my church, my community is my bridge group, my community is. Um, and they're not talking necessarily about geographic space. Mr. Helfont, let's move on to the next item. If you have other questions, Jayla will be here. You can always reach her. Good afternoon, Matthew Helfand, Senior Transportation Planner here at Dr. Cog. One second, let me get my question up. Uh, I think I've got it.
So good afternoon, everybody. Oh, sure. Better like that. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so Jayla pointed out uh, a key uh, concern in the older adult community here in uh, the Denver region. It's transportation and mobility. And one way that um, we can improve the lives of older adults and individuals with disabilities um, here in the Dr. Cog region is uh, through our proposal that I'm going to talk to you today about. So um, just a little bit of background and history on the, on the FTA 5310 program. Um, Dr. Cog you, uh, used to select projects for, for this program and its predecessors. Um, RTD previously managed the program till about 2013 when it transitioned to CDOT. And um, federal statute requires that Dr. Cog, as the MPO, uh, recommend to the governor um, who should be the designated recipient for, uh, the, for the Denver region. And we've done that twice with the 5310 program, uh, once for RTD and, and once for uh, CDOT. So some background. This is a project, uh, this is a program that funds projects that increase the mobility of older adults and individuals with disabilities and right around two million dollars is allocated annually to this program in the Denver region. Uh, projects are uh, eligible projects include operating expenses to provide transportation for older adults and individuals with disabilities, uh, mobility management, which is a um, a way to organize um, transportation in the community and coordinate it so that it is uh, more available for uh, those who need it. And uh, capital investment, um, most of the time it's vehicles, but sometimes uh, also uh, some small infrastructure projects like completing sidewalks, especially those leading to bus stops or um, uh, or any other way to make uh, sidewalks more accessible, or bus stops or transit stations more accessible. So uh, eligible activities, uh, I, the key here really is that any, any project has to exceed the Americans with Disabilities Act requirements. So if we're providing services, uh, the, the, the ADA requirements uh, state that you must have those have services that are uh, curb to curb if, if you're providing demand response transportation. Uh, so these services that, that we provide uh, through this program go door through door, door to door, and assist people to get into the vehicle, not simply just stopping at, at, at the curb and waiting for them to come if it's needed. So the funding is distributed uh, through three different pots. Uh, so you can see on the map there, the Denver Aurora urbanized area is the biggest part of the map there. And that is a large urbanized area. And through this program, funds are distributed directly to the large urbanized area. And like I said before, um, RTD was uh, the direct recipient. Uh, then it went to, uh, it's currently with CDOT. Um, so there's basically three types of organizations that are eligible to be the direct recipient for, uh, for a, a large urbanized area. It's the Department of Transportation, CDOT, uh, a, a transit provider, or the MPO. Now, you can see the small urbanized areas, uh, Boulder, uh, Lafayette, Louisville, and Longmont, also on the screen there. And money for... Um, for this program uh, for small urbanized areas is distributed to the states and the states make it available and administer projects in the small urbanized areas. And then areas outside of, of the urbanized areas or rural areas, um, the money is also distributed to the states and the states, typically the DOT, uh, distributes it and administers projects outside of the urbanized areas. So just some desired outcomes, uh, and this is a little bit more global uh, because we foresee having a coordinated human service transportation program that benefits uh, all vulnerable populations, individuals with 
disabilities, older adults, veterans, uh, and, and other vulnerable populations. It's really about um, providing better service and more service to those populations uh, through reducing administrative and, and service duplication. So uh, with the same amount of funding, trying to do more. Um, breaking down silos, a lot of different uh, funding programs have silos and we want to break those down. And then just really, it, it results in, in efficiently using taxpayer dollars to ultimately provide more services in the community for those who need it. So um, CDOT, like I said, is the current administrator for this program uh, in the Denver Aurora urbanized area. That was that large spot. But they also, like I said, administer the program for the small urbanized areas and outside of the urbanized areas. And um, they are doing an excellent job here in the Denver region. Um, that is not the reason why uh, we are uh, pursuing uh, becoming a, a, a direct recipient of this program. Um, but I'd like to highlight some benefits uh, that Dr. Cog can bring. And, and those are really the reason why we'd like to do this. First of all, um, as you know, we are the MPO, the Metropolitan Planning Organization here. And in that role, we lead transportation planning for the Denver region and coordinate and collaborate with others in order to do that. Of course, with our, our planning partners, CDOT and RTD, as well as all of our member governments and the stakeholders in the region. We also, um, we also are in charge of putting together and updating the uh, coordinated transit plan. And um, in the 5310 program, it specifically requires that projects of this program must come from that coordinated transit plan. So if we are working with the community to develop this coordinated plan that talks about what the current needs are, and what the future needs will be, uh, and, and then those needs are converted to projects, then it makes sense for us also to think about um, administering the program and being part of implementing the plans that we develop. So um, also coordinating and integrating multiple funding sources. Uh, very recently, uh, you. You approved, um, and thank you very much, and the community uh, will be very appreciative. Um, you approved an additional $1 million a year uh, from the Transportation Improvement Program for Human Services Transportation uh, for uh, the 2020, uh, 2020 to 2023 TIP. Uh, we have that. Uh, Jayla talked about the Area Agency on Aging. We have Older Americans Act dollars and Older Coloradans Act dollars that we administer in the community. And so coordinating those two with the FTA 5310 program makes a lot of sense. And one of the reasons why it makes sense is blending and leveraging uh, the sources to, re uh, to reduce match requirements. Now, uh, many of you know in your community that there's often a local match associated with federal grants. Well, um, the FTA actually allows federal dollars outside of the US Department of Transportation to be used as local match for, uh, for example, for 5310. So we can use the Older Americans Act dollars that we are spending in the community as a match for that grant program by, by simply giving credit for the services that are already being provided. At, toward that match. And that ultimately reduces the match requirements of the, of the sub-recipients of the program, the, the actual transportation providers and other um, agencies in the community that are providing the services. And so ultimately that means that we can provide more services in the community through doing that. And so also, um, we, many of you know that we are working on a electronic trip exchange that helps these transportation providers uh, share trips in the community. And this helps specifically with trips that go beyond jurisdictional boundaries or service boundaries. Oftentimes there's an agency 
that it's hard for them to provide both sides of the trip or they can't go all the way because of the boundaries they have but now uh, we are developing a way for them to share trips and ultimately this should help provide more trips in the community and um, we can integrate that with this uh, coordinated human service transportation program and also streamlining the process so agencies have to um, uh, apply separately for separate programs and contract separately at separate times and um, they, they, they have to have separate audits for separate um, programs. And so that takes a lot of time and effort. And it also makes it so that it's difficult to budget and plan year to year when you're, when you're applying different times for different funding sources. So we can look at the region holistically, make the allocation decisions and have um, an opportunity for agencies to apply once for several sources of funding, which saves considerable amount of Im administrative time and effort. It also, um, yes, these programs have different, um, different, different requirements, and so we can't get around that, but what we can do is consolidate the, um, the, the auditing process and the invoicing process so that they're doing it all once. It might, they might have to report on separate things, but at least we're doing it all at the same time. And so this is a, a model of how administration uh, could look in this coordinated human service transportation program, once again with those three different funding sources. So you have the, the, the federal government on the left, and then the, the, the funding flowing through Dr. Cog and then um, these are uh, some, but not all of, th these are the major um, subrecipients uh, currently in the Denver region. And so many of them either act as a broker and or a transportation provider. In most cases, they do both. And so they have sub-grantees as well uh, that, they, uh, that they select with the funding they get, and then they oversee them. And so this is, this is what that would this is what that would look like. And then this just shows the money flow. And so those three different funding pots combine to get this bigger funding pot so we can fund more projects in the region. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions that you would have. Comments or questions, please. Still figuring out the mic. Thanks for that presentation. So um, since Boulder County has its own AAA, we're um, very interested in this question and eager to work directly with Dr. Cog's staff on whether or not this makes sense and what the model would look like. And I appreciate the fact that we've put in that request and you all are being responsive. But um, still a work in progress in terms of what this might look like. And in particular, since as you noted, half of the small urbanized areas in the state of Colorado are in Boulder County, Boulder, uh, Lafayette, Louisville, and Longmont. I guess we're particularly, uh, we wanna make sure that that funding continues to flow the way it has been. Um, we, haven't, we don't have any complaint with how things are going now, so we wanna make sure that at least there is no harm and so I guess I, I, my, and pardon my ignorance because I'm not that familiar with this program, but is the money that is designated for small urbanized areas required under 5310 to go to those small urbanized areas? Or is it, if it gets thrown into the Dr. Cog pot, is it then eligible to go to other non-small urbanized areas within the Dr. Cog region? So it, money that, the, the money flows to the large urbanized areas the small urbanized areas and the rural areas, and money that is earmarked for small urbanized areas must be spent for projects in small urbanized areas, and the same thing with large urbanized areas and areas outside the urbanized areas. And so we've had an ongoing uh, dialogue with CDOT, and um, the, the way this would generally work is that we would become the direct recipient of the large urbanized area, and then we would discuss an equitable formula 
to, to, uh, to get funding for the small urbanized areas and then fund them as well. Uh, and of course, part of that conversation would, would, um, would be about the funding that they're currently receiving, that they've received in the past, to try and uh, keep those projects whole. And so we would, we would work with, um, with CDOT to, to, to work that out so that we would work with those communities and keep those projects whole. I mean, if I may, um, I might just add to that. Mess with the button. <laughs> I know, right? Um, no, I mean, I appreciate there is some trepidation, I mean, some consternation about this, right? I mean, anytime you talk about someone else taking over responsibility for funding allocation, you know, we want to make sure everybody feels comfortable. And I think that's the case, at least particularly in, in Boulder County and the small urban areas. I think originally we had only really discussed with CDOT the possibility of taking over the large metro portion. Um, and then through discussions, it, 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 was, it was suggested or there at least a conversation about, well, let's just make the region whole somehow, right, the, the money that flows directly to the Dr. Cog region, then it would be allocated according to federal, federal law and all that kind of good stuff. But, um, but we will continue to work. We're not going to take action on this until such time that we all feel comfortable with how this is going to work. Um, so I, I, I hope that gives you some comfort, but, but we, will. we will. We won't move forward. I think what we really liked about this, I mean, we approached CDOT um, probably a year and a half, two years ago about this proposal. Is really when I, I first came on and Jayla and I were talking about this a little more and recognized the silos that we had just within the agency related to transportation and, and AAA monies that it was like, shoot, I mean, it just made sense if we could, you know, combine all the pots of money that are, that are eligible for this type of service, we should probably do it, right? And um, we approached CDOT about that. And, um, and recently, you know, they came back and said, you know what, that makes a lot of sense. And so I want everybody to understand that it's not something, this is not an affront to CDOT. They're, they've, they've really they've approached us about the next step in doing this. So I hope everybody understands that. Um, but so, yeah, so we'll, we'll continue to work with all of our jurisdictions, all the, um, the, um, the awardees right now that receive monies. We've had a, a meeting or two with them. Um, and then we'll bring it back to you all when everybody, when we feel comfortable enough that, you know, we have a plan in place and, and uh, go forward. But ultimately it needs, needs the uh, signature of the governor to, to uh, make that happen. I miss anything, Matthew? And there would um, also be a, a pretty significant transition time for us to figure out everything and line everything up and, um, and coordinate with the, um, with the other area agencies on aging in, in the Dr. Cog region, uh, make sure that we can get that benefit of the match funding uh, work with the area agency on aging in in Boulder so that we're getting that match credit uh, there as well and coordinating with them and we've reached out to them and we'll have dialogue with them and and work with them uh, to, to make this work if I could just respond thank you that does give us great comfort and appreciate the willingness to work through issues obviously figuring out how right now the the small urbanized areas compete as I understand it, statewide for the money. Mm -hmm. So nailing down how do you dip, figure out which portion comes to our region, that's a question we'll want to know the answer to before we'll feel fully comfortable to state the obvious. So thanks so much for that. Mr. Flynn. Thank you, uh, Chair. I wanted to follow up on Director Jones's uh, concerns also and, and somewhat uh, alleviated but it would be really helpful to me and I don't know any other directors feel that way rather than just seeing a flow chart would it be possible to, to populate a spreadsheet with numbers from prior years so that we could see how and then have an explanation from staff on how these changes would affect that flow and how it could be different uh, and if I understand correctly from the presentation because this is new to me also we as the MPO we are the ones who designate who what is the entity that uh, handles this? So we designated RTD for a while, and then CDOT, and now we want to self-designate ourselves. And it sounds like the advantage to that could mean some marginally additional money uh, because of the being able to use the older Americans' money as match. 
So it sounds very positive, but uh, I'm, I'm numbers oriented. And it would be very helpful before this comes up for action down the road to see a spreadsheet of how the money flows now and how it might flow uh, under this change. Thank you. Mr. Deal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On slide 42, help me out with these acronyms. I guess SRC, Senior Resource Center, and VIA, and Dr. Mack, and... Oh, sure. SRC is Seniors Resource Center. They are located in um, western, uh, near Wheat Ridge, western part of the region. Um, then Douglas County is obvious. VIA is VIA Mobility. They're located <laughs> in Boulder County, and they provide... Um, human service transportation, paratransit, they contract with RTD to actually uh, provide some fixed route in Boulder as well. Uh, they're a pretty big agency. Um, Dr. Mack is the Denver Regional Mobility and Access Council, and their role here is to provide a forum uh, to discuss uh, transportation coordination amongst the various providers. They also provide other services like uh, driver training uh, for things like disability etiquette, uh, so they, they uh, provide many different services that help with uh, transportation coordination here in the Denver region. And um, are there any other acronyms that, that I needed to go through? Thank you. Sure. Mr. Beacom. My question, my question is, um, Staffing issues. Right now, uh, CDOT's got the staffing set up and going. Uh, we do not, though we have staff doing similar things. Um, so what would we have to gain in staff uh, numbers, FTEs, to be able to do this, or is it something that would fit within our normal operation? So um, either way. Well, I might take a shot at that. Um, no, you are right. It will require some additional staff support for sure. Now, it's primarily on the contracting side, and, and that, so that, that side of the shop, the administration and finance side, and we have at least proposed at least a, a part of a position within contracting that would handle that, that work. Um, uh, you know, as part of this, we would be eligible for up to 10% administrative uh, we can we can take that off off the grant amount to help fund that that uh, that position. Um, but it's from you know on the planning side, Matthew would certainly be involved with that as well as I'm, I'm looking to Ron because he knows more about you know the, the guts of that about exactly where, where the staffing um, would come from. Staff store grab a mic somewhere. Mr. Chair. Roger from Douglas County. Go ahead, Roger. Uh, well, I really appreciate it more. I just have comments, not necessarily staff questions. Uh, as uh, staff knows, uh, Douglas County has had some conversations with this, and we have some uh, pretty good concerns. I really appreciate uh, Director Jones's comments regarding small communities. And uh, what I really like to mention is, while I appreciate the presentation, whenever there is a issue that arises, I think we really need to hear pros, cons, challenges, problems. So what I didn't hear, well, first of all, I did hear that CDOT is doing an excellent job. Douglas County has been doing this. We are utilized this heavily. We are one of the fastest aging populations in the country. So. And, and as Jayla knows, we've been doing an excellent job with providing transportation services for disabled and senior populations. So the point is, on a couple of things, have we heard any complaints from CDOT? No. Have we heard any complaints from the recipients? No. Have we heard any complaints from the contracting agencies? No. And when it comes to reporting requirements, we in Douglas County have had no problem with any requirements of auditing or reporting. In fact, we believe it's been a simpler process working through CDOT versus going through Dr. Cog, uh, what we envision. So I would like to say, you know, right now, this does not seem to be a good proposal. I really do see this more challenges. 
and uh, for we at Dr. Cog, but I see there's some advantages for Dr. Cog and other reporting transportation uh, uh, issues that we'd have with other federal programs. But what I didn't hear, and I did hear say, yes, this will be a, uh, provide more services. You can make that statement. That's just an opinion. There's no proof to that. Right now, we're working at a 6% administrative level. We're very effective with this. We do a lot of uh, services contracted with area transportation programs. They are manned by a lot of volunteer hours. So from Douglas County, we have some grave concerns about this, and I really think we have to hear the pros and cons. And again, have we heard any complaints from anybody? No. So that's what I really appreciate if we get that full respect. And that's what I, I, I really demand that of staff, just as if you ever heard of our legislatures when they talked to lobbyists, said, you better be, a give, be, better be able to give me the pros and the cons. And here, I really don't hear any cons from the recipients, from CDOT, and for the contracting agencies. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, sir. Mr. Papsdorf, if you want to follow up with your questions. Um, yeah, just the the staffing. I, on the TPO, so the transportation planning and operations, I don't think we see any staffing implications for this. Um, uh, Jayla's shop, the AAA, already has a couple of staff that manages the uh, solicitation process for allocating the Older Americans Act uh, funding for senior and disabled transportation services that are already flow through Dr. Cog through the AAA. Uh, we've talked, about, as, as Doug said, talked a little bit about maybe the, the contract administration side. There might be some, some need to beef up that side in the um, accounting and finance uh, department, but we, we think uh, that we can handle the solicitation and actually coordinating all of the solicitations across the various funding sources in, into one call for projects actually makes the administration of those programs a little bit easier. Um, this is Jayla and uh, Roger is right. Hi Roger. Um, they provide excellent transportation under the Older Americans Act in Douglas County. Um, to that it is, uh, the Older Americans Act requires us to be, to audit annually um, for them to have, to turn in monthly reports on their um, trips and, and cost, uh, cost of those trips. So it is, it is more of a oversight than CDOT money. That wouldn't change. The CDOT money would still be monitored the same way. They wouldn't it, we had a discussion on this. Um, we wouldn't audit the same way on the on the fifty three ten dollars as we do on the AAA dollars. No sense in putting people through that. I'd like to make uh, the the auditing process easier in the Older Americans Act, but haven't gotten there yet. No, and I, I uh, Director Partridge, if you're still in line, um, yeah, I mean, you know, man, I, I appreciate your your concerns down south, and we'll continue to have conversations about, you know, how we might be able to alleviate those. But really, I mean, it should be pretty fairly seamless, regardless of who the designated recipient is. Um, it's it's primarily just that, you know, we we're responsible for for the execution of that money. So um, whether it's us, CDOT, or RTD, I mean, it really should be seamless from a from an awardee's perspective but we'll continue to have those discussions with you guys down there and um i know we've had a meeting or two and we, we can we can definitely schedule some more very well thank you ed rex and i think the point is that no one's asking for a decision today this is just a heads up of something that's coming for discussion and those discussions are still planned for the future so Let's be interested in it. Let's provide feedback if, as you're contacted by staff. But there is no decision. Jones, go ahead. Just one question. Um, you're allowed to take up to a, a certain percentage, 10% for administrative funding. Is that money that CDOT takes now to administer it? So I just want to make sure that we're not decreasing the overall pot by changing the CDOT does use that now. OK, so, so it, would it wouldn't change the fund. Any questions from anyone else on the phone? Anyone else here in the room have any other questions? Hey, Matt. Thank you much. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our agenda for today. Mr. Rakowski, go Mr. ahead. Mr. Chairman. Hang on just a second. I got one in the room, then I'll come back to the phone. 
I would charge the executive committee, the executive director, and senior staff to think outside the box and improve the abysmal attendance rate, which today is 32 percent. We'd like to get more municipalities and counties to show up with these, but uh, we don't control them. No, I think you, you plan a way to do the process that may encourage people to show up. Who's on the phone, please? Oh, uh, yeah. Sorry, Jeff. No problem. This is Director Baker. I just wanted to announce that um, our Public Works Director, Dave Schmidt, retired uh, on Monday after 37 years with Arapahoe County. Uh, today we announced that Brian Weimer, the transportation manager, will be taking that position as uh, Public Works Director for Arapahoe County. And so when you see Brian, please give him your congratulations. Thank you. There's no other business. Ladies and gentlemen, we are adjourned. Thank you on the, for the folks on the phone as well. Thank you.